The significance of the moth is change. Caterpillar into chrysalis or pupa, and from thence into beauty. Our belly wants to change too. It's easy to look upon Gum's fantasy efforts to change himself into something he can never truly be as some sort of mental illness, but actually it's just an exaggerated form of a problem common to other characters in the film. The first thing that tuned me into this theme is that Frederica Bimmel has her own obsession with butterflies. There's a big butterfly accessory on a tree outside her house, and you may recall that in the novel Gum had worked for a company that made butterfly ornaments, so she may have acquired this item as a gift from him. His own butterfly transformation hanging artwork may have been from the same store. And then in Frederica's sewing room we find butterfly patterned wallpaper. So she either already had a preoccupation with butterflies or she picked up that preoccupation from Jane Gum. In her bedroom are more clues of a self-transformation motive, but they're easy to miss because they're quite common items. A dieting book and posters of the pop stars Madonna and Blondie women who have the power to be loved and admired by the masses and sought after by men, or at least that's what the marketing has persuaded her to believe. Those posters aren't just incidental props, they're in the novel as well. A bit more out of the ordinary is her little musical jewellery box. It contains a thin, dainty ballerina girl spinning in front of a tiny mirror, like it's the reflection of herself that she'd like to see. Note especially that the mirror gives a blared reflection. Is this really so far removed from Gum's camera dancing routine and the mannequins he has positioned in front of mirrors? It's the same basic principle. When Clarice opens the hidden compartment in the box to find pictures of overweight Frederica, the ballerina music appropriately falters, like the mask of innocence is being peeled away. We could even think of the box as hair equivalent of Gum's basement, where he has his own sordid photos and mannequins. Even her best friend had no idea about her hidden life. I wish you've had a friend that you didn't know about, or... No way. She had a guy I'd have known, believe me. Sewing was her life. On page 363 of the novel, Starling asks herself, quote, how did Frederica want to appear, end quote. Then she looks at diet plans and diet groups among her belongings, one of which is called Slenderella. Clarice then wonders, quote, did her longings resonate with Buffalo Bills, end quote. So the parallel was certainly there from the writer's point of view. With regard to Gum keeping women in his basement and then killing them, the novel mentions that some of the birds that Frederica's father keeps captive are killed and he's then carrying the fresh meat in a bag. In the film we see some bird or animal furs nailed up on the shed, and Frederica is shown in photos with the caged birds, yet surrounded by free birds that she has drawn around the photos. So it seems like her subconscious desire to escape her circumstances are what drew her into the arms of psychotic James Gum, the one male who seemed to find her desirable. Both Frederica and Catherine have a hidden sex life in the novel. Frederica with James Gum and Catherine with a man who was never identified because, as I mentioned earlier, her photos of her copulating with him always have his head out of shot, like she's reduced him to just being a sex object and is keeping trophies of her encounters so that she can keep seeing herself as being desirable generally. Again, there are principal parallels with Gum using women to alter his self-image. Clarice herself has a self-transformation motive that is a sort of counterpoint to Buffalo Bill, He wants to become a desirable woman, but Clarice is sick of being desired by predatory men. She wants to become a hard-as-nails FBI agent, a predator who hunts men who kill women, as well as being able to defend herself against men. We could even think of her as trying to achieve a psychological sex change of her own. In line with Frederica's pop star posters, one scene in the FBI recreation room features a poster for an old movie called Federal Agents at Large. 
It's not just Starling. Every trainee in the building is there to achieve some form of self-transformation. The moment of graduation is their equivalent of coming out of a bug cocoon, their equivalent of Gum's desire to be a famous fashion model walking down a red carpet. And then there's Clarissa's desire to sever her cultural roots and move to a different class system. And that accent you've tried so desperately to shed, pure West Virginia. So yeah, pretty much every character in the movie can be thought of as someone who is attempting to achieve some feat of self-transformation. Even the extras. Chilton obviously uses his career status to try and make himself more desirable to women. Crawford is trying to be a sort of social justice god who can eradicate the phenomena of serial killers. Dr. Lecter seems to be about the most comfortable with his own identity, but the novel suggests that his murders carried a self-transformation motive too. On page 28, Clarice ponders, quote, It was as though committing murders had purged him of lesser rudeness, end quote. And there's more in the novel about self-transformation motives being a common thing. On page 207, Crawford recalls a guy who applied to join the FBI, but showed up with a bazooka and a bearskin hat in his golf bag. Bill's own mother, who doesn't get a mention in the film, but who he is trying to become in the novel, had her own aspirations of self-transformation. She wanted to be a movie star, and when it didn't happen, she blamed her pregnancy, and likely blamed little James Gum, became an alcoholic. Then, through bad parenting, she ruined his life. So Gum ends up trying to become his own mother, even though she was no more happy with herself than he was, even though she was likely the one who most ruined his life. In a sinister example that Gum's madness isn't an isolated case, page 235 of the novel mentions that he knows of places where the truth of his suit would be appreciated. Certain yachts. That seems to imply some sort of rich secret society who approve of murder or even take part in it. And the last example I'll offer about parallels between Gum and other characters, Noble Pilcher, the wonky-eyed fella in the museum, he is yet another person who has an obsession with Lepidoptera. His buddy does too, but Pilcher is of particular interest because Starling accepts his offer of a date. The fact that he gets an invite to her FBI graduation suggests that they are now very well acquainted. The novel adds more to his character. It describes him as having eyes that look witchy and too close together. Witchy? What a strange word to use regarding guys. Remember that in the novel he also shows her a black witch moth in the museum. It also says that he has one eye that is slightly cast that makes it catch the light independently. And we get a little bit of that in the film. It's never explained, but it's like Thomas Harris is deliberately nudging us that something isn't right about the guy. After all, Harris's novels do continually thrust the idea that there's a little bit of serial killer buried deep within us all. In an ending that's omitted from the film, Clarice goes with Pilcher to stay with his family in a huge cabin that has lots of rooms. Sounds like a cosier version of Gum's basement dwelling. And in her final moments, she is asleep by a fireplace with big sleeping dogs and lots of quilts. And get this, Harris states that the other figure beneath the blankets, quote, may or may not be Noble Pilcher, end quote. Well, who else would it be? I think what Harris is getting at there is that, like James Gum, Frederica Bimmel, and all the people she's met who have hidden lives and hidden identities, Noble Pilcher may not be who she thinks he is either. <laughs>